Mighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess. mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
our shepherd. You know your sheep by name and lead us to safety through the valleys of death. Guide us by your voice that we may walk in certainty and security through the joyous feast prepared in your house. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome to Augsburg, and we give thanks for your presence here today on this fourth Sunday in the season of Easter. And if you're visiting with us, a special welcome to you, and please let us know how we can share with you and your faith journey. As we gather this week, I want to remind you of a few opportunities to be together in community as we look at our announcements published there on the yellow sheet in the week ahead. First off, that this Tuesday, you're invited just to come and eat and be together to be with others from our community as we'll support Hope Du Jour, an annual event for crisis control. And your pastors and your intern will be at uh, Bagel Station 2 on Peace Haven from 7 to 8.30 in the morning and then at Mellow Mushroom for lunch from noon to 1.30 downtown. So we'd love to see you, introduce you to other people in the congregation, learn more about crisis control, just an opportunity to break bread together as is fitting in our text today. And we hope to see you then. And then a reminder that in two weeks time, as uh, Hannah graduates Div School and law school simultaneously, uh, we'll celebrate that as friends of hers at Augsburg are putting on a reception for her on two Saturdays from now the 14th. But in order to make sure there's plenty of food for everyone, we do need an RSVP. There's an email address there in the announcement bulletins. Or if you need to, you can share with Hannah today. If email's not an option, she's in the back. Everything else you can find on that sheet there. And our service continues as we hear God's word. A reading from Acts. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
a reading from 1 Peter. It is a credit to you if, being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that, free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him, because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep, and all who come before me are thieves and bandits. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We had a lot of young friends at 8.30 this morning, and so we will continue here today but giving thanks for the children who were here earlier today. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In your educational attainment, your professional career, do you ever look back on something that you learned in your training in school and think that was the gold standard, that was the rule by which we live, the rule by which we practiced our craft, and now it doesn't make sense at all. Think about engineering, the sciences, medicine, how many things have changed. And if you've been out of school even more than a few years, what you learned in the classroom and laboratories probably doesn't apply anymore. The farther we get from our educational experience, the more we realize that we need to learn on the go because what we thought was solid, what we thought was going to be the grounding for everything that we do changes over time. Now one might think that theology is free from that because we talk about events of the past in a book written two millennia ago, but even then what I learned in the classroom has changed. And there's one thing that always catches my attention when I think about this that I learned from a wonderful and loving professor who taught stewardship, evangelism, and the practices of being the church, of being together. And I remember one of the things that he said with great gusto on a regular basis. He would say, 
The church is the only community which exists for otherwise than itself. The church is the only community that exists for other than itself. Think about it. Most communities exist for the people that gather there for a reason, for a profit, for some sort of attainable goal. But what he would preach and teach over multiple classes with him was this idea that Christian community was about the other, about outside the walls, about going and being Christ in the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that was ingrained in our head in such a way that now as we encounter a different world than the one that I learned 20 plus years ago, as this world has so rapidly changed in the last two decades, that what that beloved professor said doesn't quite make sense anymore. For think about the context in which I learned that. Community was strong. We still lived in a state of Christendom. People went to church on Sundays. It was part of your identity of who you were. It wasn't something that you were ashamed to talk about. Everybody knew that you were busy on Sunday mornings, and there certainly weren't sporting events being planned from the morning the sun rises. All the community was rooted in a sense of church, and it was accepted and practiced in part of what we are. But as we've seen in the last 20 years, not only churches but all sorts of community, fraternal and social, and groups that get together around common good have found themselves in decline, and especially after what we've experienced the last few years due to COVID. And so as we come to understand what it means to be a community, to be a church, we struggle with the fact that maybe we aren't just existing for being outside, But before we can do that, we have to figure out who we are in this place. In decades past, we may have taken for granted what it meant to be community. I know from talking to many of you that most of you who've been here a long time would say, gosh, back in the 80s, I knew everyone here. I knew their families, I watched them grow, and I knew where the kids were going to school and what they were doing. It it just made sense. But now, now there's so many people that I look around and see on Sunday morning, and I have no idea who they are. Your eyes and nods admit that many of you have said this before, if not even to me. Right? There was something different about community, about the way that we shaped our time around when we gathered. It was already part of what it was, and so it made sense to be reminded in the classroom that church is not a country club. It's not where we just come to feel comfortable, but it's rather a call to be out in the world. But now, that need, that basis of who we are, challenges us to find a sense of community in an isolated world where we find ourselves so often disconnected from others and unable to find places where we can gather, where we're not afraid that people are going to judge us for what we think or how we act or who we voted for. The idea of finding community that will accept us for who we are is harder than it's ever been before. And so when we find such a place, we want to grasp onto it. That, my friends, is what the gift of church can be. But we're called to recondition Hundreds of years of thinking of what we've been as church since we got off the boats of our ancestors generations ago and formed these communities that were safe and always there for us. When now we long for that when the world doesn't have that anymore. In an online community that I'm part of, which there are plenty of those, I join in regular conversation with other pastors who lament the fact that community is on decline and we look for the reasons that that is happening and the ways that we can solve it. And as I started to think about these texts today, even though the familiar Good Shepherd text would have been a way to go, I found myself drawn again and again to the words of the book of Acts, which Don read just a few moments ago. Because every Sunday in the season of Easter, we read about the early church in the book of Acts. We come to understand what those first gatherings of people were like. And very quickly after the Pentecost experience, the church was growing by the thousands. Thousands of people were being baptized at any given time. And the growth of the church was they knew what their mission was. Because the presence and the resurrection and the ascension of Christ was so recent that people had that energy to work off of. And that carried him in a gift of being community. And so when it says here in this task that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of the bread and prayer, that makes sense because that was what was moving them. 
And it makes sense that the apostles were doing so many signs and wonders that certainly there would be a sense of awe that lived out among the community. And then something very hard for us to imagine in this day, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Everybody bring their checkbooks. This is not a text on communism. This is not a suggestion, as sometimes people get distracted, that we're to go and sell everything we own and to give it all together. In fact, we know that's not the case because as we look at examples of faithful people of the church later on, we learn stories of merchants like Lydia who still had businesses and homes but shared their gifts as part of the principle of who they are. And day by day, this community spent time together in the temple and at home with glad and generous hearts. Everything they did, day by day, the Lord added to the number of those being saved. So this early church, it had purpose, it had reason, it had recent story to help guide them of who they were called to be and why they were doing what they did. And so it made sense that they devote much of their time to being together, to breaking bread, that it would make sense that if they had more than they need, they weren't going to need it anyway because they knew Christ was coming again and they could sell the extra that they had to support those who didn't. It was the heart of community. It was an understanding that everyone was there to be taking care of others. It was the gift of the Greek word for fellowship, koinonia, which refers to a fellowship that is a partnership, that everything is shared together, a gift jointly contributed, a collection, a contribution, a communion. It was everybody gathered together in one place and at one time to share in purpose. Oh, wouldn't that be great today? We would long for community of that nature. We would long for a place where we could all be on the same page long enough to break bread and share in fellowship and recognize the needs of others and instantly address them. We would long for a time when we're able to come together and say, oh, this is the way it used to be. But the world around us brings us challenge and pain. The world around us brings us distractions and naysayers and all that that keeps us from gathering together. The world around us provides us with plenty of excuses on where else we could be instead of gathered here to break bread together. But this is not a new concept. This is something that happens throughout the ages of history, and it was certainly present in Germany in the 20th century. That between the wars there at a time where the Germans were in a state of disarray and this rise of nationalism was growing fast, there, there was this idea that church wasn't necessary and that all would gather together under a new and evil force. And yet in the midst of it stood a brave and bold pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer who understood the cost of discipleship and the need for being together. And in his book, Life Together, Bonhoeffer wrote, A Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another or it collapses. I'll read that again. Bonhoeffer wrote, a Christian fellowship lives and exists by the intercession of its members for one another, or it collapses. Friends, once again, the evil forces of the world around us, the forces that grab hold of us, that claim that anything else is more important than the word of Christ, that who we vote for, that where we stand on an issue, that how we express ourselves is what defines us, that that keeps us sometimes from being community, that that keeps us from drawing together in intercessing with one another to be drawn together at this place, even though the places of the world distract us from that. And so we are once again at a point where it might seem like community will collapse. We see and read stories, we hear anecdotes of friends in their churches that are closing on a regular basis. For every one church that will open in the United States this year, four will close. This rapid decline that we face in this place and safe gathering of community is drastically dwindling, and we are called to address that. And so before we can go out into the world and care for others and share God's love with them, then God first invites us to be community and understand that what the people of God did in these first churches and acts is what God still calls of us today, to set apart time, to set apart resources, to set apart ourselves for breaking of bread, for praying for one another, 
for caring for one another, for providing for the needs, for simply being together so that once we are strengthened as community, we can go out into the world and care for others. And as I was thinking about this text this week, I was thinking about what communities can be a model for that. And as I thought more and more about it, I kept turning back to the fastest growing church in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the fastest growing congregation that has emphasized community as the heart of who they are and the building block for how they are called to be God's purpose in the world. It's a relatively new congregation. It's a mission start, but it is one that is growing rapidly because people are feeling that sense of community and belonging in places that they haven't before. Maybe you've heard about it because it's right across the street. It's the dwelling. The dwelling congregation is the fastest growing congregation in the ELCA. And all of those who gather there with Pastor Emily Norris and all those who are called together in service have been rooted in this understanding of community. And as I say, it's so important for us to be drawn here and together. I'm going to give you permission to miss church sometimes because I'd love for you at 11 o'clock to go and worship at the dwelling sometime. But if you simply show up at 11 and receive no bulletin, but rather a welcome, and you gather in that place to be fed by the same word and sacrament that we are here, you're going to miss what happens because community starts long before 11. 9.30, 10 o'clock, people are gathering. They're breaking bread. They're having a snack. They're getting a warm cup of coffee after a long night, and they're together, and they're sharing in love, and they're asking questions, and teams of people who are designated to be care people are looking out for those who might have slipped through the cracks and they're working to make sure that they have what they need, just as they did in Acts. And then when worship is over, when God's word has been proclaimed, when Christ has been shared with us in the gift of sacrament, they go and break bread together every week having a meal. Now, that might not be the liturgical or worship style that you want. I certainly hope that you feel fed here at Augsburg as well. But it is a reminder of what they do and what we do as siblings in Christ is rooted in the gift of community, of being drawn together. And how are we, as we come out of COVID, as we explore new life, as we set strategic goals for the future, how in everything that we are doing here do we return to these tenets of a faith of acts to be rooted in being drawn together, to be sent out into the world? We are called to gather together. We are called to form a union. And when we teach kids in First Communion class what that word communion means, we help them to understand the words community and union drawn together. And that's what God does here in this place, that no matter where you come from, no matter what is in your pocketbook, no matter what life has given you, no matter whether it's been easy or hard, whether you're troubled or lifted up, God is here for you. And God feeds us at this table. God gathers us in the same promises of sacrament that the disciples shared in the earliest days of the church, of being nourished in bread and wine, the real presence of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ that strengthens us to be community so that once we exist here, then we can go out and exist in the world. It's hard to find real community. My prayer is that as people of God together, we can provide that here for those of us already here, for those who have slipped away, and for those we have yet to meet. May the church in Acts send its spirit upon us so that we can continue to do work started a long time ago. Thanks be to God. Amen.
sing together in trust and hope, we confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. You are the shepherd who gathers us in your mighty and loving arms. Help your church to listen for your voice, especially when the voices of sin, idolatry, and oppression threaten to overpower us. Lord, in your mercy. The green pastures, still waters, and dark valleys of this earth all belong to you, O Lord. Sustain your creation with a love that is both mighty and just. Where there is destruction, bring healing. Where there is desolation, bring abundance. Lord, in your mercy. You proclaim shepherding love, comfort, and protection for all people and all of creation. Direct leaders in our time to learn from your example and instruction. Give them servant hearts. Lord, in your mercy. You journey with us wherever our paths may lead. We pray for those feeling overwhelmed by anxiety or depression or suffering in any way. Today we lift up Art Velorti, Randy Klein, Sandy Nicastro, Daphne Hillcastle, Jeff Cole, David Kinley, Christian Martin, Bob Deaton, Phil Williams, David Tate, Terry Hayworth, Betty Jo Hartman, Colt Cameron, Shirley Yunt, Michael Mattei, Tommy Napier, Anne Marie Sneed, Susie Walden, and all those we lift up on our lips and in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. You are the sheep gate that gives safety to your beloved flock, provide protection for refugees, victims of violence, those who are imprisoned, and all people who are vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. You call your sheep by name and lead us through the valley of death. We give you thanks for those who have died and now dwell in your house forever. Be with those who mourn and give them hope in the promise of resurrection. We remember Pastor Matt Ernst, Mike Holland, Stephanie Tannis, Nanaline Nichols, Bill Anspa, Helen Matthews, Eleanor Langfeld, Kearns Fries, Reg Cahill, Marion Morgan, Chris Almarini, Nancy Julian, Clark Comer, Lord in your mercy. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you.
Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love, the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ the true paschal lamb who gave himself to take away our sin who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord. Unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power.
body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and can continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.